so we're going to give everybody just another minute to hop on. We have a packed agenda today uh, with really exciting speakers. So um, if you are here, we're going to start with Dr. Sagerson finishing out our conversation from um, last week. I know some folks had questions. If you do have a question for Dr. Sagerson, um, if you can get that ready, we're going to only have about 10 minutes for that. Um, so if you, she's going to do a quick recap of the presentation and uh, we'll be doing that. And then we have Rough, Rough Haven. Actually, we're going to do Meals on Meals America next, and then um, we'll finish out with Rough Haven Crisis Sheltering. So packed agenda, lots to get to. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, and before we get started into the agenda, I just want to mention one thing. Um, I shared a link to a book called What Happened to You? Um, and I think I know like six, I think six different people told me in six different ways they were reading this book and it was changing their life. And then the presentation by Sheila, Sheila's one of those people, um, made me get it on Audible. And it is truly like, it is like such a life-changing book and it's Oprah Winfrey and Bruce Perry uh, talking about trauma and resilience. And you can't help but think about shelter workers, uh, our, our customers, our clients, and animals themselves when you read it. Uh, it's an amazing book, um, but I really recommend it. It's, it. it's called What Happened to You, uh, and it's a relatively new book by, uh, I think it just came out recently by Oprah Winfrey and Bruce Perry. But the Audible version, they're reading it. Um, and so it's almost like a conversation between them, but it's, and it's, and it's all about for like science geeks, it's all about the brain. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really informative. Um, okay, well, before we get started into our agenda, I want to turn it over to Mary Smith from Maddie's Fund. Thank you, Kristen. Okay, you guys, it's really great to see everybody. Laura and Betsy, two of my most favorite people. It's really, really good to see you. That's just awesome and everybody else that's here. Okay, so last week I told you about a special announcement. The special announcement was last Saturday, Maddie's Fund awarded the 2021 Evanzino Leadership Award to Dr. Lila Miller. If you don't know who Dr. Lila Miller is, you should stop the presses and Google her. She is the mother of shelter medicine and actually all of the great things that we are able to provide to the animals in our care are because of her and the work that she's done. And I would imagine that if there are any veterinarians on this call, they have all been touched in some way by Dr. Miller. She is just a super badass and an amazing person. And if you ever get to New York City, you should really try to meet her. She has spent 42 years in the profession and she's the closest thing we have to a rock star. So Dr. Miller, thank you, thank you, thank you. Also, I have a self-serving announcement. Maddie's Fund has a forum uh, survey that is being um, sent out. If it comes to your mailbox, will you please fill it out? And if it comes to your mailbox, will you please share it with others? This is a way for us to get feedback from all of you on how to make the forum better. And let me just remind you that the forum is a safe, non-monetized place to share ideas and to connect as opposed to that other place. And the last thing I wanna um, share with you all is yesterday I had a chance to see a video from a woman named Leslie. She is a retired police officer. She lives in the Baltimore area. Before Leslie retired from the police department, she had a very special canine companion who passed away. And after a certain period of grieving, for her companion, she decided it was time to share her life with another dog. She has filled out 16 applications to organizations and she has been rejected each and every time. We are talking about a retired police officer, a woman who has devoted her life to the care of others. She's been asked for how much money does she make? What is the color of her eyes? And she's had to justify, I know, Betsy, what the hell does that have to do with the color of your eyes? I mean, crazy. But she, um, she even went so far as to travel someplace to meet a dog. She bonded with that dog, only to be told the next day that she couldn't afford to have a Great Dane in her life. 
Come on, you guys. We have to do better than this. We can do better than this. I, I'm, and I mean, I've told you guys this story a million times, but when I decided to get um, <clears throat> a dog, it, um, I too was rejected by many, many places. And so, and I think one of the most, um, one of the first times this sort of expose happened, it was at Expo and Betsy McFarland talked about the fact that she wouldn't be, um, you know, accepted either based on the criteria. She actually, it was a pretty cool presentation. There were uh, shelter leaders from all over that were on sort of a panel and they all talked about the fact that none of them would be able to meet the uh, requirements that we were putting on the adoption applications. And here we are in 2021 and we still have that same situation. And I can also tell you that the folks at CARE are also struggling to be able to adopt a second dog. So it's happening all over. So when we get really upset about the fact that puppy mills still exist, we have to remember what we do to contribute to that. Because when we tell people about the value of adopting and not shopping, and yet we won't adopt an animal to them, what do you think is gonna happen? And this woman, Leslie, 16 times she has tried to get a dog and 16 times she's been turned down. We have to do better. I can tell you as a sneak peek at the end of August, we're gonna open up a new challenge grant that's all gonna be about open adoptions. It would have been great if at this point we didn't have to do that anymore because everybody was doing it, but it seems like there's a really big need. And lots and lots of organizations have come together to support this. So maybe 2020, 2021 can be the year when we really, the, um, what, you know, the baseline going forward, it's all about open adoptions, where we don't have to hear any more stories of people who can't adopt. Because as Sheila's gonna talk about as it relates to trauma, and as she told us last week, for humans, some of the most effective efforts to deal with the trauma in our lives comes from connections that we can make, safe connections with other humans and with the animals in our lives. So with that, I'm out. Kristen, thanks so much for giving me this platform. All right, you guys have a great weekend. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, and I just wanna mention two other things related to that. Kara is putting out some amazingly moving videos on their Facebook page and their other social platforms about adopters being turned away. Um, they're really worth watching and worth sharing with your staff. Um, and we just put out, we've put out a couple of blogs about this, but we just put out one with 27 common barriers that we're seeing. Um, and it's a good list to share with your staff and volunteers because we're finding that people don't always even know what barriers are and they don't even understand why certain things are barriers. So um, I think that there's a there's a lot of misunderstanding even among animal welfare professionals that <clears throat> things like a home check is actually a potentially discriminatory policy um, turning away adopters. So I we're going to take about five total minutes for national org updates. So if you have something you don't need to say and can just share it in the chat, please do. Uh, we have Jill here from Cal Animals for an announcement that's important to all of us. Um, and if there are any other national orgs that really need to chime in, um, not in the chat, that's fine too. But uh, we ask that you just keep them brief because we do have a packed agenda. So Jill, over to you. All right, thank you. So as many of you know, we've been hosting an emerging leaders program for up and coming um, animal welfare professionals in California. And it's been a six month program. Um, it's gone very well. And we've got a very bright and shiny group of people getting ready to step into leadership positions. And on the 26th, Monday the 26th, from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m., we are going to have a final uh, leadership symposium from this group that you are all invited to attend. Um, anyone is invited to attend. This will be a showcase of presentations from this group of people so you can learn more about the program. And um, I wanna give a huge shout out to Jerrica Owen and Bobby Mann for their leadership of this program. They really made it happen. And to Maddie's Fund for their generous sponsorship 
um, for covering the cost of it. So it's been really good. Um, and it looks like we've got the link in the chat. So, and I encourage you to, to send that out to your up and coming leaders as well, if they wanna sit in and take a look at that. But it's been a great program and we actually have three leaders from this year's cohort that are gonna be um, managing the program for us next year. Thank you. Okay, it sounds like Hillary, you have an announcement from HSUS. Yeah, I do. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Hillary, and I am the acting VP of the Outreach Engagement Training Department here at HSUS and wanted to make sure all of you know that our uh, call for submissions for speakers for Animal Care Expo in Orlando next year is open. Um, we're going to put in the chat links to the form to, to indicate your interest and to let us know what, uh, what you're interested in speaking on. But I wanted to let you know it's on the schedule. It's going to be April 19th to 22nd in Orlando. Um, and we look forward to hearing from you if you're interested in speaking at the conference. That's it. Great. Thank you so much. Any other announcements that need to be made um, from National Orcs? Great. Okay, we'll get right into it. So Dr. Sagerson, you gave this talk last week. And I mean, I just it's all anyone's been talking about since. So I want to turn it over to you to give us just kind of a brief summary of what you shared and then allow anyone here to ask questions um, based on kind of what you shared with us last week. Sure. Thanks, Kristen. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. So I talked about trauma last week and trauma specifically encouraging us to think about it as it relates to trauma. Trauma thinking of it as an emotional reaction to a deeply distressing or disturbing event that our body can't um, cope with and overcome. And we talked about how experiences we have, anything can be traumatic obviously, but experiences that we have very early in our lives tend to be the most impactful and humans we know from from that first month is most important and these experiences can have if we don't work hard to resolve them lifelong lifelong impacts on our relationships with others and a lot of what i talked about was theory and thought and things for us to talk about because we really don't know the role of trauma in animals. But I feel like a lot of times when we say the word stress, sometimes we could be putting that word trauma in place instead. And so we talked through all the background of that and I didn't get much time to talk about where do we go from here? Why is this important? And I think it's important, as you mentioned earlier, from the standpoint of how we treat our coworkers. Um, we have trauma at work. We, we have to have some challenging conversations sometimes and there's trauma at work. The people who are coming to us are oftentimes experiencing trauma. So being aware of this topic from the people standpoint is really important. But from the animal standpoint, in terms of coming to the shelter and staying through the shelter is a traumatic event for most animals and that they're being separated from everything that they know. So working to number one, recognize and understand that and that initial bit of unpredictability that we're seeing might not be that this is a really, really evil animal that isn't safe to place, but it may be that they have experienced a trauma and it's something that we need to help them to cope with and emphasizing the importance of foster care and that the more we can do to keep them out of the shelter, it's still gonna be a traumatic event, potentially transferring from one home and losing everything they know to another, but being in an environment where they have more control over the, it makes more sense in terms of reducing the amount of trauma that's been exposed. I could probably go on, but that's, is that good for a brief summary, Kristen? Uh, yeah, what it made me think about is that we've traditionally, I mean, I think this is a longer conversation and probably we need to dedicate another full hour to it, but what I heard most this week is that we've traditionally thought about dog behavior as sort of decontextualized from trauma, like it's just something that happens and it's something that poses risk. I really wanted you to share how things could change for how we manage shelter dogs based on taking a trauma-informed approach. 
Sure. So by taking a trauma-informed approach, I think first and foremost, it's understanding more and understanding that that bit of unpredictability or that outburst of excitability that we're seeing might not be a personality trait of the animal, but it might be a reaction, the body's reaction to trauma. So understanding, I think it's just so valuable for us to be thinking about this that we can recover from trauma, we can recover from it and be okay. And we would assume the same is true for animals. So I think we really need to be thinking about the potential, that behavior that we're seeing in that dog or cat. Is it because we know they have a long history of X, Y, and Z, and it's been, which may be related to trauma too, but is more likely to continue? Or is this something we don't know why it's happening, we need to have in our heads this may be a response to trauma and we need to be doing things like forming their relationships with these animals and helping them to feel safe and bringing consistency into their lives and their environment to increase their ability to cope and to increase their ability to heal from this and then that will allow us to see was this a traumatic experience why they're acting that way or is this something that we is more serious I want to turn it over to anyone else in the group who has questions. Um, I, uh, there's a request to have a seminar that staff and volunteers could be invited to um, surrounding this topic. I think it's a huge, it's huge in helping staff and volunteers understand the animal's experience and a better approach to help them. What are your thoughts on that, Sheila? Is it, is it time to start talking about this? outside of this kind of group of leadership or do you think it's too soon because we haven't done a lot of research in the area of sheltered animals and trauma i think it's it's i think personally i think the most important thing to talk about because we know is trauma amongst ourselves we know for fact the trauma amongst people and what we're experiencing and i feel very strongly that that it's a good idea to bring that in first especially because one of the theories behind treating trauma is that I can't help you to get better unless I've helped myself first. So helping our people first and bringing someone in from the human world to talk about these things, I think is a, a really good first step. So there's another question in the chat. Um, from Jane McBride, could you speak further to the care that is advised to a traumatized animal? You suggest calm, stable, consistent environments. Um, what it, can you say a little bit more about that? Sure, I can say a little bit more, but I want to give a caveat that this is these are all things that I have just been exploring and starting to use to help and support animals. The things we've been talking about for a while, but I, I am not saying at all that this is what you have to do. But translating from the human literature and what we do to help people with trauma, they, we talk about the six R's, which the first is relational and safety. So creating relationships in a safe environment relevant. We need how we're helping them to be relevant and valuable to them and something that they recognize. Creating repetitive and patterned and structured interactions. So consistent and structured environments is the third R. The fourth R is rewarding. So the the when we're trying to help trauma, that's pretty basic, right? We want the type of support to be something that's rewarding and something that they will receive and enjoy. The next one is one that's the most interesting to me, and that's rhythm. And when we talk about people and rhythm and helping to heal from trauma, we're talking about things like music. We're talking about things like dancing. We're talking about things like walking, running, rhythmic, repetitive um, activities that can help us to regulate ourselves and recover. And I really think we need to think about that with dogs. It could be as basic as walking, but Dogs chewing on bones, right? That's a really, really rhythmic activity. Or there's dogs who like to knead their blankets and suck on blankets. That's a really, really rhythmic activity. And I feel like we could talk, spend an hour talking about all the things that our animal cats do, all the things that our animals are doing that are that are rhythmic activities and might be helping them to regulate themselves and and recover from trauma. 
And then the last R is respectful. So we want the type of support that we're providing to be respectful to the to the individual, and that's critical. So those are the ideas that we that I feel we need to be thinking about when we're trying to help animals to heal. What do you think the relationship between this and sort of fear free is? I mean, is there a direct relation between fear free and how we should be handling all animals all the time in shelters? I personally feel that there's a very strong relationship with it in that when we have animals coming into an experience that is very likely going to be traumatic and we do things to them that I that are either purposefully via training techniques or inadvertently via handling techniques causing more fear we're exacerbating that trauma and that six R is respectful. And that to me is so important. And a big part of that respect is treating them in a way that is not making that fear, anxiety, and stress like we talk about in Fear Free worse, but helping them to recover. Any other questions here? We have just another couple minutes. So shout them out if you have a question. Dr. Sigerson, I we have your recorded presentation. Do you think that's something that that people can share with staff uh, members and other folks, maybe volunteers who are working with uh, particularly challenging animals? Yeah, I think that's definitely something that can be shared. I also did a presentation on this topic in the uh, foster working group for their foster collaboratory meeting last week that would be a good one to We're share so excited to have dr sagerson here today. well sorry someone's playing the video um and i really encourage everybody to continue this conversation on maddie's pet forum um this is my favorite topic to talk about and we don't know the answer and i think by all of us thinking together and ruminating over this idea we're going to learn a lot and grow a lot and help animals more so i um, hope to connect with you on the forum Awesome, thank you so much. Um, we're gonna now uh, shift uh, to Heather Camisa, who is going to introduce our next speaker. So Heather, welcome and take it away. Oh, thank you, Kristen and Mary for facilitating this fabulous and important connection between our next speakers uh, with a major social service leader and with welfare um, leaders across the country. Good morning, everyone. I'm very pleased to introduce, and we at ADISA are honored to have worked with Carter Florence, Senior Director of Strategy and Impact at Meals on Wheels America, who will share their programmatic portfolio and groundbreaking research, which was recently published, to identify needs and support clients with pets thriving together at home nationwide. Carter has a doctorate in public health from East Tennessee University, she works to understand and empower Meals on Wheels programs in delivering the more than a meal service model. In her professional capacity, Carter supports grant making efforts aimed at building organizational capacity, providing education and training for implementing best practices and sharing lessons learned and assists with the design, testing and development of turnkey, scalable programmatic resources aimed at offering enhanced services, particularly in the area of nutrition and socialization. Carter has a long history working with and supporting community-based organizations to successfully design and implement health improvement programs and policies, specifically in rural and underserved areas. And in fact, Carter herself is an Appalachian native. And I'll turn it over to Carter to introduce some of her colleagues here today. Thank you so much, Heather. It's lovely to see you um, and some of your other colleagues. Hi, Jyoti. Um, and uh, thank you all so much for having us. It's uh, very exciting to connect with you all and, and um, 
see some familiar names maybe, but a whole lot of new ones for us. We're very um, much new into this, this space. And I'm really excited to be joined today with my colleagues, um, Laura Blazis and Morgan Holtquist, who support our social connectedness and pet work nationally. Um, and so when we were thinking about today and, and joining you all and connecting with, uh, with this group in particular, I thought we would take um, a moment to take a step back and give a little bit of background about Meals on Wheels network, the clients that we serve, um, and then I'll turn it over to Laura and Morgan to share more about our pet work and our recent research. So um, for those folks who may not know, Meals on Wheels America, um, the organization that Morgan, Laura, and I work with, is the national leadership organization supporting a grassroots group of more than 5,000 local community-based Meals on Wheels programs. Um, and many of you, um, depending on where you are, may already be connected with your local Meals on Wheels program, and we'd love to, to hear more about that as well. But since the first known delivery in the United States back in the 50s in Philadelphia, Meals on Wheels has really been guided by a single goal of supporting senior neighbors to extend their health, dignity, and independence as they age. We advance that vision at Meals and Wheels America by providing research, advocacy, education and training, grants and funding directly to local Meals on Wheels programs, which in turn serve as a lifeline to our country's most vulnerable older adults. Prior to COVID-19, the network had more than 2 million volunteers and hundreds of partners across the country who helped us drive our mission and serve more than 2.4 million seniors every year. Those numbers are very over or out of date now because of COVID-19. Um, our cause has always been a, an incredibly important one, but it's particularly vital today. Our nation's older adult population is growing, outpacing available resources and leaving an increasing number of older adults facing hunger and isolation. Even before COVID-19 emerged as a global threat, nearly 10 million seniors in America struggled with hunger 8 million lived in isolation, and more than 7 million had incomes below the poverty line. Meals on Wheels exists to serve older adults who are 60 years and older and who are at greatest social and or economic need. And the profile of seniors receiving Meals on Wheels reveals the high degree of vulnerability among our participants, the majority being 75 and older, female, living alone, and having three or more chronic conditions. A disproportionate number, more than 25%, are living in poverty in rural areas and are Black, Indigenous, or persons of colors. And the meal delivered often represents half or more of their total daily food intake. And we all recognize that senior hunger and isolation have a dramatic impact on an older adult's health and well being, not to mention one's ability to live safely and independently at home, where most of us all want to be. Seniors struggling with hunger and isolation are more likely to experience health outcomes that lead to hospitalizations and premature placements in nursing home. Medical costs associated with senior malnutrition alone exceed $50 billion annually. And on top of all of it, these issues are exacerbated by poverty, making it that much harder for seniors to access the resources they need to live nourished lives. Many of the factors that make older adults more susceptible to social isolation and loneliness, which are two key areas that we're very interested in how our pets work um, falls into the work that we do. Um, but the, many um, of those factors like living alone, managing limited mobility or having a past experience with falls are very commonly found among seniors receiving Meals on Wheels. And in some cases, the volunteer or staff member um, working with a, a client may be the only person that's seeing that client in a day. So Meals on Wheels staff and volunteers are an invaluable part of a senior social network. And we like to say that Meals on Wheels delivers more than a meal to help keep seniors healthy, safe, and independent in their own homes and communities. Our holistic more than a meal model adds older adults with a nutritious meal, a brief friendly visit, a home safety check, and connections to other needed community-based services. Meals on Wheels' ability to build one-on-one -on -one relationships has also enabled local programs to provide eyes and ears in the homes of some of the country's most at-risk seniors because staff and volunteers see their clients regularly, 
they know them on a personal level, and they're able to recognize if a particular client is experiencing a health or safety issue out of the norm that could go unseen otherwise, making meal deliveries essential interactions for socially isolated clients who are more susceptible to falling or other injuries that may require immediate or emergency assistance. Staff and volunteers can then make necessary connections and referrals to services offered by Meals on Wheels programs or in the community that the senior may need. So by addressing the nutrition, socialization, safety, and community connection needs, we're able to improve mental health, reduce falls, improve feeling of isolation and loneliness, and reduce worry about being able to remain at home for our clients. But I'm going to turn it over to Laura to talk a little bit about the fact that that's not enough. Thanks, Carter. And as Carter is saying, we know more must be done. You know, for, me, for years, many Meals and Wheels programs have been extending their work to focus on expanding ways to meet the social connection needs of our clients. Above and beyond the basic more than a meal model, programs may offer enhanced programming, and that might include social connection services like friendly visiting, telephone reassurance calls, or pet programming. And over the last few years, we at Meals and Wheels America have been investing in a number of partnerships and research efforts to further explore social isolation and loneliness with an emphasis on exploring evidence-informed solutions to better address the changing nutrition and social needs of the clients that we served. With COVID-19, many more elder adults became at risk of food insecurity and social isolation in a relatively short amount of time. And now more than ever, older adults are relying on Meals on Wheels programs to provide services, including essential socialization, and local programs have been rising to the occasion. Meals on Wheels programs are seeing that social connection needs of their clients are mission critical. We also see the work see this as work that we've always done. We've been expanding how we do that specifically and how we support the human animal bond. A story often shows the connection more than I can. And with that, I would love to share Patsy and Winston's story with you. Morgan, I don't know that the audio is working. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Morgan, if you go back to the share, you have to turn on the audio share. So. Sorry, where is the audio share? It's actually back from when you first shared your screen. Got it. You may actually have to stop sharing and then reshare, and there should be a little button that says um, sound. We made sure that we had the video pulled up so that it actually played correctly, but this is, this is technology and the virtual working from home. So thank you all. All right, I think we're good. Sorry about that. This is Winston, a cuddly, snuggly 14-year-old schnauzer mix. And this is Patsy, Winston's 84-year-old owner. Look at him. Look at him. Winston has amazing superpowers. Thanks to Winston's calming presence, Patsy is more likely to have lower cholesterol, a slower resting heart rate, and decreased risk of cardiovascular disease. Yep, I can do all of that, just being me. And when he wants to go out, it keeps Patsy more physically active. Where she goes, he goes. He looks into her eyes and sends telepathic signals that say, we're on this planet together, you and me. And Patsy is more independent and happy because Winston is always by her side. Thousands of homebound seniors rely on their pets to live independently. Meals on Wheels relies on partners like PetSmart Charities to help provide the food, supplies, and vet services that keep seniors and their pets healthy at home together. Learn more at mealsonwheelsamerica.org pets. I love that video. It's just a, a beautiful story and sorry you have to hear from us because that's just the best part right there. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about our research. So to better understand the needs of Meals on Wheels clients who are pet owners, uh, we launched a research study looking at our clients' needs for a variety of pet-related services, uh, their barriers to accessing these services, and how the human-animal bond supports socialization and reduces isolation. Um, the study involved a telephone survey with 303 pet owners from 37 different Meals and Wheels programs across the country who offered different types of pet services to their clients. 
I also wanted to say a big thanks to our research partners at Adiza and University of Tennessee Knoxville and our supporters at PetSmart Charities who made this work possible. So this graph, uh, I just wanted to show briefly, it paints a picture of the types of support that Meals on Wheels clients are most in need of to care for their companion animals. And the, the three that really rose to the top were pet food, vaccines, and nail trims. But it also really shows the, the broad spectrum of, of types of needs that, that clients experienced. So our research confirmed that there's a strong need to support Meals on Wheels clients in caring for their pets. Nearly 30% had foregone personal care in order to care for their pets. And this echoes the anecdotal feedback that we had heard from Meals on Wheels member programs, many of whom launched pet programs after learning that their clients were sharing their own meals with their pets. And furthermore, half of client surveys indicated that they didn't have anyone other than Meals on Wheels to help them with their pets' needs. Our research also highlighted the barriers that Meals on Wheels clients face and the significant gaps in access. Half of pet homes were unable to access veterinary care over the previous two years, nearly double the finding of other research. And this is also 50% higher than even a study of families receiving SNAP benefits. Uh, the top barrier that was identified was financial, but transportation was also a very significant challenge. A key piece of this research effort was examining the human animal bond. Um, as I'm sure will come as no surprise to anyone in this group, nearly 100% of the clients surveyed reported that their pet brings uh, happiness to their life. Uh, a really interesting discovery was that while 64% of respondents were at risk for social isolation, uh, only 45% were classified as lonely, which is lower than might have been expected, especially given the spikes we've seen in loneliness during the pandemic. You know, the terms social isolation and loneliness are often used interchangeably, uh, but those are distinct concepts and loneliness is, is a subjective experience that's determined by an individual's perception of their experience. So while many uh, pet owning clients were isolated, they felt less isolated. 70% um, of those we surveyed lived alone. And among this cohort, they had the highest bonding scores highlighting the companionship that pets offer to people living alone. Um, and finally, I wanted to highlight that 80% of those surveyed agreed that the support of Meals on Wheels programs helped them to keep their pet. And now I'll turn it over to Morgan, who's gonna talk about the great work of our Meals on Wheels programs. So just to talk a little bit more about what this looks like on the ground, um, to help us focus on and expand this important work nationally, um, PetSmart Charities is currently funding a three-year partnership with Meals on Wheels America. Um, this partnership is the first of its kind given its national scope. Um, overall, these funds have really helped us to develop the scope and the scale of this work um, in a variety of exciting and, and really impactful ways. Um, first, through the Meals on Wheels Loves Pets grant program, um, local Meals on Wheels members have been able to start or expand existing pet programs. Uh, these pet programs um, improve access to pet food, pet supplies, and um, pet care, which includes preventative and holistic medical care, uh, temporary pet boarding, dog walking, and grooming. Um, additionally, by the end of this year, we will have granted $300,000 to local Meals on Wheels programs um, to provide emergency pet food as a direct need due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Additionally, these funds have supported the recent research that was just shared by Laura, um, which have of course helped both organizations better understand the needs of Meals on Wheels clients and their pets. Um, the partnership will also continue to support additional research efforts as we move into next year. Um, we've also been able to focus on education and training efforts in order to develop and share important resources um, and trainings with programs who may be looking to support um, the start of their program or even just helping with more simple challenges like growing their volunteer base um, or thinking through more local partnerships as well. And then lastly, um, we've also been able to demonstrate the importance of this partnership um, just by simply sharing the stories and the firsthand accounts of clients who have benefited from this support and of course the companionship of their pets. Um, Looking a little bit more locally and just at some statistics, uh, a 2018 survey did show that 52% of members were offering some form of pet assistance or pet food delivery, um, and 11% were considering adding this, these services. Um, so we definitely see a, a high interest in um, this program and the services that they provide. Uh, and then in 2020, thanks to our partner PetSmart Charities, um, the grant program served 18,000 people and 11,000 pets 
uh, and more than 100 Meals on Wheels programs in nearly 40 states. Um, so a really exciting reach there as well. Uh, and currently our uh, grant program is being launched um, and has of course been heavily influenced by our recent research report. And we're really looking forward to investing um, in this year's grant program. Speaking of this year's grant program, um, it aims to grow and expand programs abilities to ensure seniors and their pets can be happy and healthy together. Um, and this year access to care was actually noted as an important need by many local members who had surveyed um, or received recent feedback from their clients. So our grant application featured um, a significant portion of applicants who are interested in addressing needs related to vet care or support services. So with that, um, we leave you with some lovely photos of seniors and their pets. Um, and, and we may have a few minutes for questions. Um, if not, I know our emails were shared um, in this presentation so we can answer them of course via email, um, but we really thank everyone so much for your time. So Kristen, I think we'll turn it back over to you to answer questions or to moderate questions that may come from the group, I believe. Yeah, I think Julie, do you wanna ask your question? I think it's a good one. It's sort of what I was gonna ask as well. Uh, sure. I mean, I just know, especially over the past year, we've been working really hard, all of us in creating uh, community-based and local programming. So, and we've been focusing all on partnerships as an important piece. So. I'm just wondering what your um, input is on um, on the collaboration rather than just starting another new program. Like I, I certainly would want our local program to be partnering with us so that it could be positive for both of us, not necessarily starting a whole nother new program. It just doesn't make sense. So I was just curious. Yeah. And, and our apologies if that did not come across clearly in our, in our remarks. Our goal is to have local partnerships and kind of support that capacity building locally. Mills and Holes America is not interested in, in bringing vets on and having access to care delivered through Meals on Wheels programs. We're interested in developing those relationships with individual organizations that have those to be able to, to have that, that um, interaction happen and understand how does that partnership happen and how can we potentially scale that when it does exist. I think the the real, um, and Morgan and Laura, please feel free to jump in here as well. Um, within the, uh, the traditional of what we've seen in terms of starting with pet food even, um, we see local programs working with their animal welfare um, partners who maybe, or pet food banks who maybe have pet food and then are able to, to deliver in um, some of the food that's been received, but getting it into the, the client's homes. Um, Laura or Morgan, anything else you'd want to add to that? Uh, Morgan mentioned the, the education and training that we've been providing. You know, one of those exercises was an asset mapping piece, um, encouraging local programs to take advantage of, of all the incredible opportunities for partnership in their community. So there, there's a lot of interest in that, a lot already happening, but I'm sure there's a lot more that we could certainly foster and support. Do you think that, do you think that partnerships, I mean, we only have another minute or so, but do you feel like, and Heather, I'm curious to hear from you too, doing, I mean, or any of the folks that do so, like, what is the takeaway for shelters? Like everybody's busy, everybody's strapped, but we know there's a huge need for more partnerships like this. Like what are kind of the key takeaways that folks on this call need to hear? And, and any of the, uh, any of you all uh, who, I, who I mentioned, uh, please chime in. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Kristen. And I think if everyone takes a look at that report, they're gonna see that there's massive barriers faced by this population like transportation, access to veterinary care. And it really is um, working and leveraging, you know, all of our expertise. I mean, having a partner like Meals on Wheels America and what that can bring all of us for, you know, social work expertise um, and delivery out in communities where we're all trying to penetrate. We can really just do so much more. And Julie, to your point, um, that was one of the questions asked of clients was, have you gotten help from a local humane organization in the past two years? Only 16% indicated they did. 
And I know that's really heartbreaking for me when, you know, we all work so hard to get our services out there and food pantries are something a lot of us do. Um, so there's a lot of people we're not reaching and, and we can reach them together. I don't know if Jyothi has anything else. Well, I think you mentioned that really important number because one out of two Meals on Wheels clients receives, who has pets receives help from Meals on Wheels America, but 16% only reached out in, in two years to a humane organization. So that, that really speaks volumes, I think. And um, there's, there's a lot of opportunities and I'm really grateful that uh, Carter and others have, have really been presenting this. So please do take a look at the report. It has a lot of really good data in it, in addition to what um, was presented today. And um, Adisa is always open for um, questions. We come every week to these calls. So if anything comes up, we can always relay it back to the Meals on Wheels America team. Awesome, thank you all so much. Um... I really appreciate you being here and uh, looking forward to reading that report. Um, Want to turn over to our friends from Rough Haven. Who is here from Rough Haven today? And I'm Christina Pulsifer from here. Hi. Okay, so we saw this organization. I think Best Friends had posted something about you all and then went to your website. And if you haven't clicked on the website, um, you, it's roughhaven.org. It's really a, an incredible venture. So uh, we really just wanted to hear a little bit about what you're doing and how other communities might start this kind of program themselves and how it's going. So will you just tell us a little bit about your work? Sure. So um, we actually officially opened our doors last June. So right in the heart of the pandemic, we had started um, preparing and, and came up with this, this need in our community. We're in Salt Lake City. Um, and uh, in January. So we'd started the process, you know, COVID wasn't even a factor at that point. And we just, you know, kept going and knew that that was gonna be the time um, to serve the community. And it, and it really has just been kind of a baptism by fire um, from then. And um, we've been very, very successful and um, have served, I think over 180 families during that time um, with that. So. Um, I'm a licensed social worker. I work for adult, a criminal justice service agency. I love the trauma informed uh, communications and stuff that have been happening. I'm very passionate about trauma informed care. We've done that with our criminal justice agency, which is an innately traumatic sort of organization um, as it's well. So that's how we uh, sort of formulate and, and develop our relationship with our clients. And, we say that basically the animals are the heart of our organization, but our clients and the people are the soul. And I think in order to do this kind of work, you really have to know that while animals are really important, it is developing the relationships with their humans that is going to make this successful. So um, we've had a 98% successful outcome rate. We do consider successful outcomes being uh, both direct return to, to owner and to family, as well as private rehoming. Uh, so we will work with the, the clients that aren't able to, you know, have their animal anymore for whatever reason, and we will help them find the right fit so they do not enter the shelter system and continue um, that cycle of trauma of not knowing where their pets are going, that they're, you know, being surrendered to who, who knows who and in the shelter. Um, so that is a successful outcome data point for us. So we, um, I guess maybe our, we have our heart and soul and then our brains are our, our data. So we've started collecting um, um, information from, from um, minute one, where the referrals are coming from, what kind of uh, situation. Christina, can I just stop you? Because I yeah. don't think people even know what your organization is. Oh, so I'm so sorry. I just am like, hey, let's just get going in it. So <laughs> you, will you kind of yeah. back up and tell us what Rough Haven is? Because I, I don't think most folks on the call are familiar yeah. with that. Um, so we, we are a pet retention, keeping pets with our people organization and that we provide the um, uh, boarding crisis sheltering for people experiencing a temporary hardship. So domestic violence, hospitalization, eviction. Uh, substance use treatment, short-term incarceration. So we're definitely not, um, you know, the first organization to be doing this in the country. We worked with Lost Our Home Pet Rescue in Arizona that kind of helped us 
gather some paperwork and go from there. So um, basically it's about, you know, preventing uh, shelter intake as well as keeping pets and, and people together. So that's our main, our main program. And then we've also kind of evolved as we've, as we've grown to provide a lot of other uh, pet retention services, such as free vaccines. We will provide daycare. We partner, um, one of our co-founders owns a boarding facility. And so we do utilize boarding as well as fosters. Um, having that brick and mortar facility has been tremendous um, in our, our success rate. So um, that has really helped us to be able to, you know, intake animals immediately kind of understand their their personalities and then find foster homes. So about 70% of our clients are coming to us due to housing insecurity right now, which I don't think is a, is a shock to um, anyone. And we're also been working more with the unsheltered community. So um, one of the things that's really important to us is that we, in a very genuine and sincere manner, talk about our clients as also being animal welfare heroes, that it's not just uh, you know shelters, fosters, transporters, that these are people who are making tremendous sacrifices to keep their pets with them. We have a gentleman living in his van with his cat who had a significant head injury who would not go to the doctor um, because of you know, not leaving his cat. So we cared for his cat for about six months, which we try to do 60 to 90 days. Um, but again, part of being trauma informed is uh, you know, being individualized with care. Uh, that's Nisa and Nene at our, at our top. She was um, living in one of the homeless resource centers, pregnant, needed to go have her little guy there, Lyrics, and um, needed a place for Nene to go uh, while she was in the hospital. So she was in the hospital for two days, had, had the new baby, came back, picked up the dog, went on public transportation to their new house. And they just, I mean, she was incredible. So uh, we, we love and support her in that. She got a new apartment. And I'm just, while you're talking, I'm just scrolling through the website yeah. because it wasn't really until I went to the website that I was like, oh, wow, this is super innovative. Like this idea that an organization would just focus on own pet um, fostering and keeping own pets with their families during times of crisis is really incredible. And I love how you guys have the clan testimonials at the bottom thought this was really powerful that you're kind of telling the stories of folks. And do you feel like that's an important part of what you're doing is kind of giving voice to the folks who are facing these situations? And Lexi, in fact, right there, she is now on our board. So uh, something that was really important to me was having someone with lived experience join our organization. And Lexi was a client of ours. She left a uh, domestic abuse situation, uh, got custody back of her two cats. And she just has been tremendous support. And you know, one night I was just trying to get to bed thinking about all of the things that I was like, we need to ask Lexi to be on our board. And she has been wonderful. She was able to reach out to clients who are nervous that we're going to adopt their animals out or not give them back. You know, so she has that um, direct link and can speak to that and um, has just been an integral part of, of what we do and our success. So you have, I mean, one of the things I noticed, and this, this call is really for shelter animal welfare leadership. And the thing I noticed about this site is that you make it so easy for people to get help. Like yeah. it's all really clear. And then you make it easy for people to, to, um, to help. Uh, but do you feel like having kind of a simple, here's how you help, here's how you get help. Is that at the key of why you're successful? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Um, you know, we, because I am a social worker, I, we don't have to take referrals from other local agencies. So we just screen everyone ourselves and just um, ask a lot of questions. Um, we do have kind of a, a robust application, but we will fill it out with them and per, you know, over the phone, we, we just want to remain barrier free. So whatever it takes, um, you know, to, to be able to do that. And so, and also that helps us place the animals in the, in the proper foster home. So yeah, so we, we, they can just text us. We prefer text. We get back. We're all volunteer organization. Um, you know, we get back within a few hours and, and really work with, with people to, you know, case managers a lot. We work with a lot of our social services um, providers in the community as well. And um, can anyone start one of these programs? I mean, I think what we're thinking about is when I saw this, I thought, okay, 
every shelter needs to encourage folks in their community to start something like this. Do you need to have those specialty social worker skills and that expertise to start a program like this? Or could, with the help of someone like you, any community start this? Yeah, I think any community can start it. I do feel like having some type of social services person on your team, even if it's a student, you know, um, in any capacity is what's really going to help because there are a lot of these people are in crisis uh, and, you know, are maybe not thinking properly. They do have to be spayed and neutered, which we pay for. We have an official MOU with our Humane Society. Um, we work very, very closely with them and that has been a tremendous success as well. Using data, we were able to show how many pets they referred to us that we kept out of their shelter and what their cost would be. Um, and so that helped them say, okay, we are gonna do all your spay and neuters for you. Um, and, uh, you know, be able to do that. So yeah, developing those um, re uh, relationships has been really, really instrumental, not only on the animal welfare side, but the human welfare side. Okay, we are like just about out of, out of time um, and don't drop off the call yet because we have something to announce about next week that's important. But Christina, is there any sort of last words of advice? Are you willing to be contacted by orgs? Of maybe course. Like yeah, of course. So I'll just drop my um, email in the uh, the chat. And um, yeah, we really appreciate you having us. And this is work that I'm really passionate about. And we just were a recipient of one of the PetSmart charity grants. So we're super excited for that and to continue to, to move Yeah, you're a, you're a real hero. And this work is amazing oh, and, and just so cool. So we're really happy thank to you. have you. Um, Next week is big. It is the culmination of all this stuff we've been talking about. We have Heather Lewis coming from Animal Arts to talk about the future of shelter design, what shelters need to look like in the future versus what they look like today. And this becomes a really fundamental topic for us to talk about because there's this, I, there's this hope that we can really change what it means for an animal shelter to serve the community. But that organization needs to be built differently than, than our organizations are built today. So Heather's gonna talk about what she sees as the future, but we're also gonna have a conversation about that. So we want lots of folks to weigh in about what, what you all think needs to happen in the future. I know there's a lot of consultants on these calls who work with a lot of shelters. Um, Dr. Robertson's here today, but I know that this is one of the things you walk into shelters and think, I wish this place was structured differently. Um, so we're gonna kind of talk about the biggest and best ideas about what future shelters need to look like. Our goal is to get 300 people on the call uh, because it's such an important topic. So please invite a leadership level person on your team, invite someone from another organization. This is one you are not gonna wanna miss. So uh, we will see you back here next week. Uh, we are so grateful to Maddie Sun for hosting these calls every week. And next week, we're also going to touch on COVID and the Delta variant, because as you'll remember, many of you, these calls started with COVID and we are not out of the woods yet. Things are not looking good. Um, and so we'll be kind of touching back on COVID and some of the things we may be expecting looking at counties like Los Angeles, who are now once again requiring a mask mandate for indoor um, indoor gatherings and, and what that might mean for our work this following winter. So Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it was so good to see you and we will see you back here next week.